Let's look at three reasons why Europeans so feared the Indian Talwa. Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now on this video I talk a lot about colonial era warfare. And there's one fact we can't avoid, and that is that Indian swords and swordsmen were extremely highly respected in the 18th and 19th centuries. Obviously primarily by the British, because the British were the most active in India in that period, but also the French, the Portuguese, and others as well. And it is indeed, I think, fair to say that the Talwar, the typical Indian sword, and there were various types of Indian sword uh, in use at India in this period, but the Talwar, which was the most ubiquitous and the most, uh, I suppose, often encountered version, and it came in various variations, we'll look at some in a second, uh, encountered in India was hugely respected and indeed feared. And was that true? Is that a true statement? Well, I think it is for a number of reasons. Firstly, we see that there are counters to it. So much the same as travelers in Japan were quite worried about Japanese, um, not just samurai, but various people with Japanese swords. And there were actually advice given to European travelers in Japan to carry a pair of revolvers and make sure you empty them both into the attacking swordsman. There were similar things in India at the time. And there were various counters that were brought in by the British, by, particularly by British cavalry and by British officers, but also civilians as well. In India, the carrying of pistols, so-called man-stopper caliber pistols, so large caliber, relatively slow moving, soft lead slug um, pistols, later on revolvers as well, to deal with uh, these sorts of attackers, very because they were scared of them uh, closing in with their swords, but equally defensive equipment as well. Believe it or not, mail, aka chain mail shirts, were actually sold to Europeans, particularly cavalrymen, going out to India. So mail shirts, uh, sometimes uh, pieces of horse equipment used, uh, stitched onto the epaulettes and the arms of um, and even the legs actually of the uniforms of the time and even chainmail gauntlets as well and even some British officers took to carrying shields so the fact is and the other thing we can't forget to mention is the British themselves also took to carrying talwar sometimes so in the Indian mutiny we've got a whole bunch of photographs from the mutiny and just after and we can see British officers sometimes carrying talwars in preference to a European sword and from the written records, for example, Robert Shebir, who was a Victoria Cross winner, he mentions carrying a Tolwar as well. So the Tolwar was hugely respected and, um, and sometimes carried, and there were countermeasures, whether guns or armor, introduced to deal with them. So why were they so respected and so feared? Three reasons. Firstly, their entire design makes them extremely fearsome cutters. Now, while they are pointy, and while some people might point out you absolutely can thrust with a tower, they are principally cutting swords. And all of the period accounts from the 18th and 19th centuries describe these principally being used to give really fearsome drawing cuts. So the main features of this design, and I mentioned that I've got different ones here. So here's a, what we sometimes call a shamshir bladed one. So you'll notice this blade is more tapered and curved. It's also long actually, and quite heavy and uh, probably woots that one. Um, and here's another one which is less curved, but is a little bit broader and really quite big, uh, quite long for a talwa. Um, but they've all got, and here's a one which has got more of a Turkish, almost a, a pala or kilich style blade on it but they all have some common features. They are, at least of these, they all have curved blades. Um, they all have relatively blade heavy balances and they all have this disc pommel and this style of small confined hilt. Now, um, this leads to several things. So first of all, we've got a relatively broad blade by the standards of the day. We've also got edge geometry, which is really quite fine, usually with a distinct secondary bevel, interestingly. It's not a single bevel. Um, usually they have a fair amount of mass towards the tip, um, and their point of balance is usually, as you can see here, relatively far from the hand. Um, and we'll talk about the hilt in a second. So therefore just the blade, that means the blade is really set up to give hacks and slices, whether it's drawing cuts or whether it's a hacking cut. The fact is the mass, the weight distribution, the general shape and form of this blade is designed much like a Langmesser or uh, certain types of other types of sabre, like 1796, or indeed uh, uh, things like a uh, falchion, certain types of falchion as well, is designed principally to give very fearsome cuts. 
And then on top of that, we have the hilt. Now this very confined hilt in here with this disc pommel, as I've spoken about in many videos in the past, means that to give a cut, you have to deploy the entire body. That is rather than just giving a sort of a, a light cut, which you can do with a tolwa, a lot of the time the cuts will be given with the absolute entire movement of the arm and body, often with a passing step moving in. This is mentioned by period European swordsmen like Captain Alfred Hutton. He's actually talking about a Afridi um, Afghan swordsman, but he's talking more generally about this area of Asia, northern India as well whereby they use passing footwork, much like was used in Europe in the medieval and renaissance periods, and therefore they're deploying the entire hip rotation and shoulder rotation to give an enormous amount of force to this cut. So the whole combination of the blade design and the hilt design leads to a sword which is going to give incredibly powerful cuts by the standards of the day that Europeans were used to, whether they were using these relatively narrow-bladed infantry officer sabres, obviously things like spadroons and small swords, and even some cavalry sabres, which generally speaking at this time were usually given with a cut from the wrist, sometimes a cut from the elbow, but not usually with a passing step, not usually with a full body, in the way that the Indians were using their tolwas. Now the next reason that tolwas and Indian swords in general were so feared by Europeans was to do with the sharpness. So we've got all of those things setting this sword up for a fantastic amount of energy being deployed into the cut. But in addition to that, a huge amount of attention was given in India to creating and maintaining sharp edges, much as it was in Japan as well, for example. And one of the key factors to this in comparison and contrasting to European forces of the time was the use of wood and leather scabbards. So it had become normal in this period with European swords to equip them with iron or steel or brass scabbards. And these had a, number one, a blunting effect on the blade, even if you made it super, super sharp. Every time you sheathed it, every time you drew it, it had the potential to make the blade slightly less sharp. Whereas a wood and leather scabbard maintained the sharpness. And this is dealt with in numerous period sources and is explicitly stated. So much so, it was even debated in Parliament. Um, a, a certain famous Captain Nolan uh, makes this point. He m mentions that um, Indian swords always stay sharp because they're kept in a wooden scabbard. Um, now the proposal came in, therefore, for British cavalry to also have a wooden scabbard. And it was concluded that the maintenance of them would be a real pain in the butt because they were jangling around, hitting spurs, hitting stirrups, all this kind of stuff, and they fell apart quite quickly. Now, the way that Indian swords are worn mean that means that doesn't happen so much, but the way that European cavalry swords were worn, or sometimes even suspended from the saddle, meant that they were banging around and from a kind of economic point of view, steel or iron scabbards made sense. Later on, however, we do get the introduction of what we call a field service scabbard like this. So they did eventually adopt it, uh, particularly for infantry officers to begin with, but it did come, out and come in for cavalry officers eventually as well although the main cavalry troopers pretty much kept steel scabbards um, for durability and economic reasons. Uh, but the simple fact is that sharpness was hugely important. And so when Europeans went out to Asia and when they encountered Indian or Japanese or Afghan people, they found that they kept their swords or knives wickedly sharp. And this really actually wasn't the norm in Europe at that time. So another reason these weapons were so feared was they were kept so sharp. And the third and final reason why Indian tolwas were so feared, particularly by the British, but also by other Europeans in India, was, shall we call it skill or practice? Okay, it was the users, the humans on the other end of them as opposed to just the sword. So you can still take all of the things I previously said and add that to the fact that the swordsmen using them were number one, often more practiced, and number two, often more determined. So if you take, for example, your average cavalry trooper in the British uh, cavalry, they would have probably, in most cases, absolutely no sword experience before they joined the army. They would then go through a fixed course of horsemanship, they often couldn't ride before they joined either. And then they'd go through a fixed course of swordsmanship, um, sword drill, pretty dry sword drill. And then they might do some independent practice or what we'd call sparring now with single sticks. And some regiments were much better at this than others, uh, particularly in India. Um, 
regiments in the uh, Honourable East India Company, often there were British officers and Indian troopers and they would have trained together and so a lot of that would have rubbed off. And in fact, some of the martial practices, the sword feats, for example, uh, seem to have rubbed off onto the British Army from Indian experience. But nevertheless, the vast majority of cavalry troopers didn't have an awful lot of sword experience before they joined the army. Um, and British officers, uh, for example, infantry officers carrying swords like this, they may have been to a rather expensive um, public school where they had some lessons in foil fencing. And then when they commissioned, uh, or when they went through uh, a military college um, and were trained as young cadets at about the age of 17, 18, they would have had yet more foil lessons and then they would have had some sabre drill lessons and they would have done some fencing practice. So they would have been trained. But in India, we had an extremely strong and vibrant culture of swordsmanship going back hundreds of years and lots of people practice swordsmanship at the village level, at the child age level. So a lot of people practicing with swords in India would have been practicing with um, gutka sticks, for example, which was a, a the gutka actually, although these days it's associated with the martial art. Gutka just means stick, sword stick. Uh, so much like a single stick, but we know that it was popular um, on feast days, for example, in villages to have competitions of essentially single stick, usually with a buckler in the other hand, although not always, and sometimes with a two-handed stick. And so, you know, the people of the sort of martial mindsets, I guess, and the families that wanted their kids to go into the military, they would have trained them from a very young age. And there was an entire, you know, village culture of people practicing martial arts with the sword. And Indian people, up until the, the mutiny of 1857 and 58, walked around, traveled around all the time with edged weapons. It was literally, you know, it was part of the culture, just like it was in Japan. So although these were regulated later on by the British Raj, at this point, um, certainly by 1857, Indian people lived around swords and knives the entire time. They knew how to sharpen them, how to keep them sharp, and they practiced with them a lot. Whereas your typical British officer or a British cavalryman, uh, just would have learnt what they needed to learn to pass the test uh, to, um, you know, basically get their pay packet. So there we go. I hope that has been somewhat illuminating. There are a lot of reasons why Tolwas are absolutely awesome swords and why I love collecting them. They're extremely interesting, extremely um, varied in blade size and shape and everything else. Even though they share general characteristics, they can actually vary a hell of a lot. And they often have a high degree of artistic uh, value as well. This one's got uh, gold and silver koftgari on the hilt. And this one's got this very sculpted uh, ribbed style from different parts of India slightly different periods, they've got, you know, slightly, or they've both got disc pommels, they're slightly different. So there's a fair amount of variation, just as with Japanese swords, even though generally they're the same type of sword, you find a lot of variation uh, between them, and part of a very, very rich and very old martial culture. And it, tilwars of this style incidentally go back to the 16th century in India, pretty much unchanged. So if you look at a 16th or 17th century tilwa, it's not very different to a early 20th century tilwa, in fact. So very interesting swords, very successful, and very rightly feared by Europeans. Thanks a lot for watching. I have been Matt Easton, and I will continue to be. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.